colleagues. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this eCancer virtual discussion, which uh, will cover the latest news in lung cancer based on the new presentations and abstract of the virtual ESMO 2020 meeting. I will share this, uh, this uh, virtual discussion. My name is Solange Peters. I'm a medical oncologist working in Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, uh, my faculty, who will be the most important people there, uh, are from everywhere in Europe, but with a little accent on Italy. We have Federico Capuzzo from Rome. We have uh, Antonio Passaro from Milan. And we have Sanjay Popat from London, who will all bring their insights and their thoughts about uh, how much the data presented at ESMO might impact our daily practice today uh, and probably tomorrow. So, of course, it's a selection of the abstract we find the most relevant, and the idea is to give you some uh, take-home messages, some key messages about innovation in lung cancer. So, I will immediately dive, uh, for the sake of time, into this uh, most important abstract. And probably, of course, we always start with what is presidential, so what is uh, the most practice-changing data. And uh, the LBA2 was uh, offering a new opportunity in a, dis, uh, in a niche, sorry, disease entity, which is the ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, where we could see the data, very positive data, of the phase three crown study, comparing lorlatinib versus trizotinib. Very nice data, but it is not the first time we have innovation in the ALK positive field. And the question is to know how much we find these data innovative and changing the paradigm in our field. So maybe to start with Alc Federico, you've been working a lot on targeted therapy. What do you think about crown data and does it change the way you perceive the treatments of Alc positive non small cell cancer frontline? Well, uh, the crown data is an important trial comparing crizotinib versus lorlatinib that is a new generation ALK inhibitor. Uh, data from this trial are clearly positive. There is a significant improvement in progression-free survival for patients receiving lorlatinib versus crizotinib. And importantly, there is a, a significant advantage for patients uh, with brain metastasis. And uh, so the control on the brain is one of the most important points of this trial. I think this is a clearly relevant trial proposing lorlatinib as uh, an additional uh, uh, first line option in patients with ALK positive and non-small cell lung cancer. This is not uh, the first time that we have uh, an agent uh, showing superiority versus crizotinib because all the new generation ALK inhibitors are showing this effect. So I think that this is not the new standard of care, but this is just a new option that we have in addition to the other agents that already we have available in ALK positive in metastatic setting. Uh, I think that one of the most important points uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, deciding uh, the best uh, first-line therapy is represented by the adverse event. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, uh, the um, uh, presence of uh, um, uh, adverse events related to the treatment is uh, of particular relevance. In the specific uh, uh, trial with lorlatinib, uh, the side effects were more frequently observed in patients treated with lorlatinib. So this is something that, of course, we need to consider when we choose the therapy, the first-line therapy in ALK positive. Sanjay, um, just to complete that, uh, we have been seeing wonderful data on lorlatinib as a subsequent line of treatment. It has been shown that even irrespective of the mechanism of resistance, uh, lorlatinib gives rise to a very nice response rate between 30 and 50 percent in patients who relapse under, for example, alectinib or under brigatinib. So my question to you is, are we favoring once again the best drug first, which at some point, at some point, might be lorlatinib, or when it is about new generation TKIs, we are happy to sequence because all of these drugs, by the way, go to the brain and are very potent. So, what is your feeling? It's a risk benefit. Do you think we will sequence Briga or alectinib followed by lorlatinib in the future, or you think we have to pick the best drugs, the strongest drug first, irrespective of toxicities? I think this is the fundamental 
question that we have now in ALK that has been posed by the Crown. Uh, and I don't think we know the answer to that question. Uh, undoubtedly, Crown has presented the best hazard ratio for progression-free survival in any of the trials against chrysotomy. But you have to balance that against the unusual toxicity profile that you get with lorlatinib. And you also then have to recognize that whilst the other drugs which are routinely used, such as electinib and bagatinib in the frontline setting, whilst they're highly effective, many patients still progress with intracranial disease. And in that setting, lorlatinib is a very, very effective drug to use as salvage. So the key question, as you've pointed out, is do you use it as a salvage option or do you use it up front? I have to say, I think with this data cut, for me, it's just still a bit too immature to rush straight into be using lorlatinib as my first line preferred drug because I'm not convinced yet of the efficacy safety ratio for a long period of time. Lorlatinib is a highly effective drug, undoubtedly. Um, it's given once a day, which is very you know, nice for uh, patients in terms of preference. Uh, we saw some very good quality of life improvement data against uh, chrysostomy, which is good. But we have to be careful because it has a number of interactions with uh, medications. We have to be aware of concomitant medications. And it has a very unusual neurocognitive toxicity profile, which I'm not convinced CTC-AE can capture adequately well enough. And this for a long period of time has the potential of being problematic. So for me, I have to say my bias is to use another next generation inhibitor up front and reserve lorlatinib uh, for the salvage situation. But you know, I think this is an area of debate and I really very much look forward to what other colleagues have to say about this as well. Thanks a lot. The second abstract, which was um, a kind of a, a very important one, it was also already presented twice in international conferences and twice in the plenary sessions, is the role of uh, adjuvant TKI in oncogene addiction. And here we have the ADARA trial, which has been uh, now published uh, simultaneously to the ESMO meeting, which was completing the data set presented at, uh, at ASCO by having some updates in numbers, which still remain amazing in terms of response rate, uh, preventing uh, the, the relapse of the disease with a hazard ratio of 0 0.17, but also showing how much this impact affects the systemic disease, but also the brain with impressive hazard ratio at the brain level. Adding here a consideration about the burden of brain disease, right? Quality of life, costs related to brain treatment. So suddenly completing the clinical picture. So Antonio, what is your take messages out of Adauha? And if we were living in an ideal world, would you prescribe Ozimertinib in the adjuvant setting to all uh, stage 1b to 3a uh, uh, operated non small cell uh, surgical non small cell lung cancer. Would you do that? Would you skip chemo? Would you keep chemo? What, what is your ideal word? We know it will take time, but if you could choose, what would you do? So, of course, the other trial was, I think, the track trial for the lung cancer community this year was a very, very high weighted for all of us. And the, the trial was very robust with more than 600 patients enrolled during the hearing. So uh, we have uh, some limitation in the trial, of course, of the role of brain evaluation before the enrolling with the brain MRI on CT scan. But uh, the, the important topic is uh, not only the survival, but also the quality of life for our patients. So at, um, the data that are presented during the ASMA are based only uh, a, a small part of patients that show where disease free heavens, uh, I think in about 11% for riosimertinib and then about 45% uh, for the control arm. But this is very interesting because uh, we can see that patients that uh, develop a progression disease, most of us have uh, in the control arm have a, a local regional disease, but also brain metastasis. And uh, we know that the development of brain metastasis is a very, very important topic for the long-term survival, long-term quality of life. So, of course, the use of upfront treatment with osimertinib, the first-line setting, is very, very active for these patients. But uh, I'm a very believer to, with the use of the TK rise in IV-1 setting to improve not only the survival that at the present time is difficult to balance compared to 
the upfront inverse line, but also for the reducing the rate of patients with a, a progression disease eventually dead in the, the, day, in the, the years after the surgery. The role of the chemotherapy, plus or not, is interesting, but I think this is not influencer from, but, uh, in data that are coming out from the other trial. So um, patient was not well balanced and, uh, for the chemotherapy, for adjuvant chemotherapy receiver or not. And the, the important question that is high debated from the MRI at the basal setting, of course, is very, very important, but this is not the, the, the clinical practice in all worldwide to date. And the indication in the other trial was that the patient can receive a CT scan or brain MRI or not in absence of clinical symptoms. That uh, I think is a, a clinical practice for all of us. So I'm a believer of TGI, but I think that a, a brain scan at the basal line after surgery before to starting a treatment is, uh, of course, uh, recommended today. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, Federico, of course, the question of chemo, no chemo, hasn't been addressed in this trial and, and would deserve, if it is really a question, uh, a dedicated trial in order to answer with accuracy. But maybe you're feeling too about this wonderful magnitude of benefit by OZI. Uh, and would you discuss with the patient, first of all, OZI, but also would you reopen the debate about chemo, no chemo? Uh, and uh, and uh, honestly, are you ready to embark into that kind of strategy in all patients with EGFR mutation? Are you testing this patient for EGFR mutation, by the way? Are you, are you buying, the, buying that, uh, Federico? Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Adora trial cannot answer the question whether we should use chemotherapy or not. But I know what happened in clinical practice. So when patients uh, come to my clinic, uh, they prefer not receiving chemotherapy. They ask for not receiving chemotherapy. And I think this is what we need to consider. So I think that today, based on the DAURA trial, first, we need to screen all patients for presence of EGFR mutation. Second, in patients with EGFR mutation, I think that giving osimertinib is the best option we can give after surgery. Um, I think uh, that uh, uh, I, unless there are some specific uh, uh, situation, uh, I prefer giving the drug without chemotherapy. Uh, this is what the patient wants, and uh, we need to consider this option. Of course, we need additional investigation because we know that probably chemotherapy plus an EGFR TKI could be superior to uh, an EGFR TKI. These are the data emerging in metastatic setting, but I think that we need a specific trial to address this question. Yeah, and probably to address also the very, very early stage, like stage, the old uh, 7 TNM stage 1B, I think we need to address these dedicated remaining question marks in the future to, to refine our, our conviction, where well, I think we're convinced about a role for TKI there. Let's move to the third presidential, and I will give it to Sanjay. It's a topic which is quite complex about multimodality. Uh, it's a very strongly awaited trial. It took some years to have the first evidence-based data about the role of giving adjuvant radiation in patients who have received the standard of care surgery and chemo uh, for a stage 3A disease and 2 completely resected, meaning no capsular invasion, uh, following the standard of care for the definition of complete resection of a stage 3A and 2 disease. And this uh, trial, the long art, uh, led by Cécile Le Péchou, who was very courageous there in continuing the effort with many collaborative groups, was basically, and despite some wording I found a little bit borderline in the conclusion, was basically showing that uh, a benefit could not be proven could not be proven by adding radiation in addition to well-performed surgery, perfect surgery, I would say, plus chemo in stage three. So is it the end of the story, Sanjay? So uh, if you have one good local modality performed optimally, plus a systemic treatment, it's enough in locally advanced disease? Well, I think that's what the trial would suggest, um, is that optimal surgery uh, is the best local modality and doesn't uh, need additional consolidation with radiation. We have to be clear what the trial showed is that there was a small DFS advantage because that was the 
primary endpoint of the trial at three years, 15% DFS advantage, but not significant in the way the trial was uh, performed. But with that advantage was the significant disadvantage of increased cardiopulmonary deaths. Now that is really of concern, actually. And I think really with that rather debatable benefit, but with that strong evidence of harm, I'm really struggling to see a routine role for adjuvant radiotherapy in this setting. Now, of course, those nodes which have extra capsular spread, which we see from time to time, those patients were not included in the study. So there still remains a question for the high risk group. Do they need adjuvant radiation or not? And of course, the R1, R2s is still uh, a, a clean indication. But for routinely, I think that trial has really put that uh, indication to rest. Yeah, you are, you are from uh, in Switzerland, uh, in France, in Germany. We are a complete fan of surgery. We have this very aggressive surgeon. You're from UK. And Cecile Le Pechou, in the discussion of the, of the abstract, was stressing the fact that uh, basically, this data shouldn't make us forget that surgery might not be the best option in this stage 3 AN2 disease. So what is your standard practice in UK? Do you have um, limits? Do you have a definition of who should receive definitive radio chemo versus chemo plus surgery in this stage 3A specifically? Well, this is a, a very open question in the UK. And there, of course, N2 uh, disease is a heterogeneous group of diseases. Uh, and there is wide variation in practice. Uh, in general, definitive concomitant chemo radiotherapy is the preferred option in the UK for N2 uh, positive stage 3A uh, lung cancer, other than exceptional cases where you might consider it in fit patients with single station disease. However, we're moving to the era of immuno-oncology and in this new era where we're considering neoadjuvant treatments, we have to reconsider all our stage three paradigms. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, Antonio, let's move to the next abstract. The next abstract is trying to identify, I found it a little, uh, first of all, confirmatory, confirmatory, but a little frustrating. We've switched to immunotherapy. We switched to immunotherapy in small cell and extensive stage small cell lung cancer. We're in the context of the trial adding atezolizumab to platinum-based chemo, the Empower 133. The authors have tried to identify characteristics which would uh, allow us to identify long-term survivors, LTS, trying to help us on guiding treatment and maybe even sparing money, time, and efforts. And what I find so frustrating is they couldn't really identify a subgroup not benefiting or a subgroup benefiting from the addition of atezolizumab. And at the end, I would say what is important is that uh, the magnitude of benefits is not the one which was observed in other diseases with immunotherapy. So what is your uptake of this one? Of course, also of the Caspian trial, all of these two trials adding, or even the Keynote 604, adding an anti-PDL1, a fortiori an anti-PD1 in small cell. Is it worth the effort? And are we going to be able to identify who should be treated like that? What is your, what is your standard and what is your feeling about uh, extensive st stages in immunotherapy, Antonio? Of course, to date, the, our standard is a chemo plus immunotherapy in a small cell lung cancer, but this data, I think, are, are very, very interesting. Confirm that uh, we need the biomarker in a small cell lung cancer, and the, our need is very, very high. This data confirm that the combination is active in regards to the a biomarker, the PDL1 or the blood tumor mutation board, and also regard the clinical characteristic of our patient. But uh, we know that we, we can find patients that have a long term performance with a combination compared to other kind of patients that have a standard performance uh, uh, like a chemotherapy alone. So, in this kind of uh, patient population, as we so in the stimuli trial, the ETOP, we, we understand that uh, the small cell lung cancer is a very, very difficult disease with a very uh, intriguing uh, microenvironment and we need to improve our understanding on the biomarkers. To date, uh, of course, our standard should be um, the, the chemo plus immunotherapy in the first line setting for the 
uh, the small cell lung cancer because uh, the, the improvement in the median over survival about three months is a, a great achievement if we look back uh, in the, the last uh, 15 or 20 years. But uh, if we compare these results, this achievement with the, with the survival of patients with the no small cell lung cancer, we know that uh, this is only the first step in the improvement of survival in the immunotherapy here and the small cell lung cancer. Thanks a lot. Let's continue on immunotherapy. Federico, we had the opportunity to discuss it yesterday. The Empower Long One. So let's be very, let's very transparent and straightforward. This is an encore trial. Empower Long One is looking at semiplimab, an anti PD1 versus platinum based chemotherapy in patients with high PDL1 as defined by TPS, by the expression of PDL1 on tumor cell of more than 50%. So this data is an encore and shows encore, uh, and still the uh, very, very strong superiority of uh, immunotherapy versus chemo in that context. I must say during the ESMO meeting, we also were able to see the long-term benefit in Keynote 24 of pembrolizumab in the same patient group. Very impressive. So I'd like, uh, Federico, that you tell me your specific feeling about this Empower Long One, which had some specificities, first of all, to allow to continue uh, the immunotherapy, adding chemo in the arm of, uh, of, uh, of uh, IO, uh, for the patients who wanted, allowing for a crossover, which was quite high, but also was performed in countries where probably specifically accessibility to IO was limited. So very specific features with a wonderful hazard ratio. So did we learn something, Federico? Is it better than the other checkpoints? Is there something, something new or is it just an encore trial? Well, difficult to say if uh, this agent is better than, uh, than other agents uh, we already have in our practice, uh, specifically pembrolizumab. Uh, certainly, these data are um, a, in the same range uh, of other trials, atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, uh, with a very good hazard ratio in terms of reduction of the risk. Of course, uh, there are some uh, uh, factors reinforcing the hypothesis that this agent uh, is uh, of interest, uh, particularly the very high rate of crossover and the fact that uh, also was allowed the combination of uh, immunotherapy and chemotherapy on second line, on patient progressing. So I think that these, uh, these factors reinforce the hypothesis that this agent uh, could, uh, uh, could have uh, uh, more activity even uh, of other agents, even if, of course, uh, we don't have any direct comparison. But anyway, I think that based on the data we have, this is an additional agent we could potentially have in first line setting in osmol cell lung cancer and reinforce the concept that immunotherapy is the new standard of care in osmol cell lung cancer. But I don't think that we needed this data for uh, learning that immunotherapy is the standard of care. So the next topic, uh, Sanjay, for me, would be to continue in the same slot of patients with a high pd one expression, more than 50% on the tumor cell, trying to envisage a crosstalk, which is well known, between antiangiogenic and immunotherapy. Basically, uh, even uh, antiangiogenic and targeting VGF is sometimes considered as being an immunotherapy per se. And our colleagues from Asia, from Japan, decided to focus on this 25% of patients with high PDL1 and to combine atezolizumab and bevacizumab. Of course, it's just an attempt, it's descriptive by nature, but I found the results exciting, even interesting in this uh, uh, Japanese phase two study. So, what is your feeling about? Uh, making more than a monotherapy frontline in this patient and added beva adding bevacizumab, Sanjay. Yeah, I was really excited to see this data. Dr. Sito uh, presented it. This is the ATB uh, trial, a small phase two. I think it's about 38 patients uh, odd uh, treated with combination of TISO, uh, bev The primary endpoint was uh, the response rate, and the response rate was really quite high, about 60, 60-odd uh, 60 percent, which is much higher than we've seen for that comparative population of the TZO monotherapy in Empower 110. So, you know, potentially a signal for uh, increased efficacy with the addition of uh, bevacizumab and that interplay between VEGF and IO. We know these are complementary strategies from 
uh, the immunotherapy uh, viewpoint. But we have to be careful because in that trial, we had 15% grade three or more hypertension. Uh, no, no grade four events, but you know this is a significant amount of hypertension, and indeed I think this is a signal that seems to be coming through. Uh, there was the other study which we'll come on to talk about uh, with uh, Bev and Nevo in uh, conjunction with chemotherapy, which also had hypertension uh, as a significant feature. So very exciting. I think this is a combination definitely worthy of further evaluation in different thoracic tumor types. As you know, Solange, we're uh, uh, evaluating this in the BEAT MESO trial, uh, which therefore has a, a great passion to my heart, uh, this combination. Uh, but we should also be aware of the adverse event profile as well. Yes, so you evoked it, uh, Antonio. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, important trial, a randomized trial of phase three of NIVO in combination with carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab as first line treatment with advanced uh, non squamous, of course, non small cell lung cancer. So, this Japanese trial, it was the LBA 54, which was uh, showing quite nicely uh, a benefit uh, of PFS, right? Of course, still no, I think if I remember well, still no OS data, it was still immature, which of course is a, a little disturbing for us, but already a trend in favor of the nivolumab arm there, but needing more follow-up. So what is your feeling now? We had, um, of course, the Empower 150 as a, as a background for combining VGF inhibition with Atizo and chemo, and now we have Nivo. So what's your feeling about uh, having four drugs on board to start? And what's your feeling about toxicity? Will it be feasible practically, financially, and are we really seeing a benefit of uh, piling the drugs, Antonio? Yes. So we have a both feeling. So the first feeling is if, if we evaluate only the efficacy data, and the second feeling is with the push up of the, the efficacy data, the financial toxicity, and the, um, the toxicity related to the combination. So we have a lot of data that confirm that the combination of uh, bevacizumab via plus immunotherapy and the chemotherapy is uh, a good, uh, have a good performance in patient uh, for metastatic setting. But the data presented by our colleagues, the Japan colleagues, uh, are, very, are very strong if we evaluate the toxicity profile. So in first line setting, which we have a, a good performance for chemo plus immuno or immunotherapy alone, uh, looking to this uh, combination for a high rate of toxicity, I think this is not the best, way, the best way for our patient, looking for the long term and quality of life. So uh, the, the trial, of course, is positive, but I, I don't see a, a window for this kind of combination in our clinical practice. Thanks a lot. I think it will also it will also raise some questions of feasibility and sustainability. Uh, having these combinations coming uh, coming later on, uh, and we will have to do there some intertrial comparison. Last but not least, uh, I will not ask Sanjay because he was involved there too. The stimuli trial. It's a it's a large phase two. It could have been called a phase three at the end because the endpoint was changed. Uh, it's the idea of giving uh, an immunotherapy in limited stage small cell lung cancer. We know, remember, that in an extensive stage, we failed uh, the second line nivolumab versus chemo. We failed the maintenance with EP nivo or nivo after chemo in the frontline setting. But always seeing this shape of the curve, with what telling us that, of course, endpoint had, was not met, so no new standard, but some patients benefit from immunotherapy. Some of them, a small percentage, they benefit in terms of long-term, extracting a long-term benefit, the tail of the, of the curve, but we fail to know who they are, and we fail, therefore, to apply the strategy to the right patients. And stimuli, a PFS uh, uh, reshape, uh, reshaped endpoint for a trial uh, randomizing epinivo versus nothing in consolidation after the full standard of care, huh? of radio chemo PCI uh, completed uh, in limited stage small cell lung cancer. This trial again failed to meet the PFS, failed to meet the OS, which was a secondary endpoint, but did show that we have this feeling that some patients will benefit. So how to move, uh, Federico? Do we need better IO? Do we need to stop to develop uh, IO uh, without chemo differently in small cell lung cancer? Have we done everything we can there? So what's your feeling about stimuli in limited stage, the opportunity of continuing? There are two big trials ongoing at least in that slot. 
and how to continue with IO in small cell? Well, unfortunately, the trial was negative because, of course, we would like to see positive data in small cell lung cancer. The point is that uh, the current therapies, current immunotherapies, uh, are marginally effective uh, in, in uh, small cell lung cancer. Even in metastatic, the benefit uh, was uh, statistically significant, but was marginal, meaning uh, that uh, we need uh, new drugs in this disease. Uh, I think that immunotherapy could have a place uh, in uh, small cell lung cancer, but not these agents. The benefit with this agent clearly is marginal, and this is also the reason why we have so difficulties in detecting the sensitive, the few really sensitive patients. Sanjay, you have the final word because we unfortunately reached the end of our time, but the final word about small cell. Can you give us a feeling about your subjective assessment of what do you believe in? We know now, for example, that we have some phase three with some new compound, teach it, for example. We also have this consolidation, well, this um, stimuli type of trial where immunotherapy is introduced earlier in the course of the treatment. So what do you believe might really uh, kind of allow for a statistically significant and clinically meaningful difference in small cell? Where would you develop or may, where would you put your, your belief and your, uh, uh, I would say, energy in trying to further develop IO in small cell? We shouldn't give up. Uh, that is clear. We have a survival advantage in the metastatic setting. Uh, and what we've seen is that in the refractory metastatic setting, there's no survival uh, benefit. So to me, uh, the earlier you can treat this disease, the uh, perhaps the greater the benefit you're going to see from checkpoint inhibitors. That's a theory, and I hope that the trials will prove this. I think what is clear is that we just don't know from an individual patient clinical data level or a biological data level who benefits from these drugs. So for the time being, we have to recruit everybody. We have to recruit everybody and it has to be large enough trials so we can then tease out the other clinical and biological factors thereafter to then work out who needs it and who doesn't need it. But for me, I think this is still game on for checkpoint inhibitors and novel IO combinations in small cell, particularly in limited stage. And I guess when these trials that are ongoing and recruiting read out, that will really help determine the uh, nature of the next five to 10 years in that space. Thanks a lot. So unfortunately, we will have to skip a, a lot of other interesting abstracts for the sake of time, but it was a pleasure to discuss with you. I think we have very important key uh, take home messages already. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your participation and uh, all of you for uh, listening to, to this conversation and have a good day.